Welcome to Come Follow Me, Act in Doctrine with Mariana Richardson and Stephanie Dib Sorensen. Today, we will be discussing The Family, a Proclamation to the World. We invite our viewers at home to share their comments below about your experience implementing the Act in Doctrine invitation. We will share our thoughts there as well. Our doctrinal takeaways today are, one, the Family Proclamation is evidence of continuing revelation through prophets. Two, our communities and the world are blessed by righteous families. And three, families can thrive when they live Christ-like principles. Welcome, Mariana. This is our final discussion in the course of Come Follow Me in the Doctrine and Covenants. And today we are actually discussing something we do not find in the Doctrine and Covenants, but that is further evidence of the Lord's continuing revelation as the Church grows and becomes fulfills its measure in the last days. And so I'm excited to talk about some of these principles. I, yeah, I, uh, I, I love the doctrines that help us to know how to be happy and to thrive in a world that is increasingly darker and difficult to navigate. So I wanted to give a little bit of background about the Family Proclamation, because it's a very remarkable document that seemed unremarkable at the time that it was given in 1995. Um, it was first introduced by President Gordon B. Hinckley actually in the women's session of General Conference, mm -hmm. where he announced that he wanted to read it and that he had chosen to share it at that particular session. And right before he read the actual proclamation, he stated, with so much of sophistry that is passed off as truth, with so much of deception concerning standards and values, with so much of allurement and enticement to take on the slow stain of the world, we have felt to warn and forewarn. In furtherance of this, we of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles now issue a proclamation to the Church and to the world as a declaration and reaffirmation of standards, doctrines, and practices relative to the family, which the prophets, seers, and revelators of this church have repeatedly stated throughout its history. You know, I remember that day so well, because I was a mom of nine children <laughs> at that point. And so I was just so in awe that President Hinckley was reading this to us women first. Yes. For me, that was such a testimony of how the Lord loves his women, and how the Lord loves families. Right, and the important role that women play as the bedrock of families. Exactly. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is that the definition of sophistry. The very first thing he said is, with so much of sophistry, we felt to do this. And the definition is a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible, but generally fallacious, meaning misleading or deceiving, method of reasoning. And so that is something that we all face. Um, we all know that the market for truth out there has a lot of competitors and we have a lot of voices and there is sophistry, there is deceptiveness that is intentional and purposeful and um, dark. And so President Hinckley said, because of that, this is why we are giving this declaration. Dallin H. Oaks spoke more recently on the collaborative creation of the family, a proclamation to the world, and he explained, the inspiration identifying the need for a proclamation on the family came to the leadership of the church over 23 years ago. He delivered this talk in 2017. It was a surprise to some who thought the doctrinal truths about marriage and the family were well understood without restatement. Nevertheless, we felt the confirmation and we went to work. Subjects were identified and discussed by members of the Quorum of the Twelve for nearly a year. Language was proposed, reviewed and revised. Prayerfully, we continually pleaded with the Lord for his inspiration on what we should say and how we should say it. We all learned line upon line, precept upon precept, as the Lord had promised. And then Elder Oaks goes on to testify. I testify that the proclamation on the family is a statement of eternal truth, the will of the Lord for his children who seek eternal life. It has been the basis of church teaching and practice for the last 22 years and will continue so for the future. Consider it as such. Teach it, live by it, and you will be blessed as you press forward toward eternal life. So one thing that really struck me about his description of the preparation of the proclamation was how intensely intentional it was. 
both the organization, the phrasing, every principle that was included and wasn't included, that for a year, those whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators prayerfully and carefully prepared this document. And I think it is significant that it was presented by the president of the church and that it was signed by the entire First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, which again give testimony to that principle that our doctrine is established by the voice of many mm -hmm. um, authorized witnesses. Okay. And yet the many are working as one. Yes. You know, and this unity In is unity. also part of that document as well. Yes, thank you. That's a great point. So when, after President Hinckley read the proclamation and um, we were all able to hear it and its principles, he concluded with this statement, we commend to all a careful, thoughtful, and prayerful reading of this proclamation. The strength of any nation is rooted within the walls of its homes. We urge our people everywhere to strengthen their families in conformity with these time-honored values. Two things stand out for me from this concluding statement, and one is that he asks all of us to prayerfully and carefully study the proclamation, mm -hmm. which is hopefully what we're going to do this week especially as we do our Come Follow Me studies, to really take time to look at it carefully and think about this intentional deliberate phrasing that has been given and the doctrines that were included. And then also he urges us to strengthen our families in conformity with these principles. Now, conformity is a word that our free human natures does not like. We normally do not like the word conformity. And there are many things where the church emphasizes agency and our right to choose about different things. But here a prophet is saying we urge conformity to these principles and, um, and do so in a spirit of promised blessings that come from it. And so I just think that's very interesting, something for us to think about, looking at this and thinking in what areas would the Lord perhaps ask me to exhibit a little more conformity or things like that? But we'll talk more about how that applies to specific principles. Sure, and I and realize that this is coming from the Lord, so it is coming from his prophets, but it is coming through their inspiration from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when I read this, I think these are the words of the Lord. And at the very end, the Lord says, we call upon responsible citizens and officers of government everywhere to promote those measures designed to maintain and strengthen the family as the fundamental unit of society. So this proclamation is truly to the world. Mm -hmm. This isn't just for members of the church. This is truly for governments. These are for political leaders. These are for everyone who has power to make sure that the family is and continues to be the fundamental unit of society. As we talk about the proclamation, there are so many powerful principles within, principles referring to our divine eternal nature, about our families and how they can be blessed and strengthened and how those families in turn can bless and strengthen society. There are warnings given and promises made, and both of them um, help us to understand consequences and blessings that come as we apply or choose to ignore these principles, right? We need to be honest and acknowledge that most families do not fit every single described thing that's here in the proclamation. And Sister Bonnie Oscarson gave a talk um, about defending the proclamation where she made a statement that I thought was incredibly insightful. She said, may I point out something obvious? Life rarely goes exactly according to plan for anyone, and we are very aware that not all women or men are experiencing what the proclamation describes. It is still important to understand and teach the Lord's pattern and strive for the realization of that pattern the best we can. Each of us has a part to play in the plan, and each of us is equally valued in the eyes of the Lord. We should remember that a loving Heavenly Father is aware of our righteous desires and will honor His promises that nothing will be withheld from those who faithfully keep their covenants. Heavenly Father has a mission and a plan for each of us, but He also has His own timetable. One of the hardest challenges in this life is to have faith in the Lord's timing. It's a good idea to have an alternative plan in mind, which helps us to be covenant-keeping, charitable, and righteous women and men who build the kingdom of God no matter which way our lives go. We need to teach our children to aim for the ideal, but plan for contingencies. Well, and I love that because this is the gold standard. I mean, this is the gold standard for families, and yet Realistically, families were in a mortal existence, you know, life happens, 
family home evenings can be pretty scary and difficult <laughs> at times. And I love statements by the general authorities that acknowledge this, the fact that it is hard to be a family, this kind of proclamation, all the principles that are there. Elder Rex D. Pinnaker made this wonderful statement. He said, within that wonderful chaos of our family, all is obviously not perfect. There are problems in our family, as in many families, challenges related to serious illness, aging parents, schooling, employment, and others. However, individual burdens and concerns may be lightened by the power of a family united in mutual love. And for me, that's the vision of a family. It's not that life is going to be easy. It might not even be easier being in a family. But instead, that through families, the mutual love that we have, we help each other to make it through this moral experience. I also think that there are many who read this proclamation and feel a little bit of heartache because they do not have families or Mm -hmm. that they have circumstances or obstacles that prevent them from forming families in the way that it's outlined here. And so I think it's really important that we remember this idea that these blessings are available to all and that this is a pattern, like you said, a standard. Elder Jeffrey Holland said the following. We talk about the pattern, the ideal of marriage and family, when we know full well that not everyone now lives in that ideal circumstance. It is precisely because many don't have or perhaps have never even seen that ideal, and because some cultural forces steadily move us away from that ideal, that we speak about what our Father in Heaven wishes for us in His eternal plan for His children. Individual adaptions have to be made as marital status and family circumstances differ, but all of us can agree on the pattern as it comes from God, and we can strive for its realization the best way we can. And then he explains the tension that they often feel when they teach these things. We who are general authorities and general officers are called to teach his general rules. You and we then lead specific lives and must seek the Lord's guidance regarding specific circumstances. But there would be mass confusion and loss of gospel promises if no general ideal and no doctrinal standard were established, and in our case today, repeated. We take great strength in knowing the Lord has spoken on these matters, and we accept his counsel, even when it might not be popular. Well, and I love that statement because I can remember when I was an at-home mom with my children and this whole thing of Molly Mormon, you know, this idea of as a woman, an at-home mom, I was supposed to do canning. I was supposed (laughs) to do quilting. I was supposed to make all my children's clothes. I think those stereotypes are gone, but these eternal principles are eternal. And there's a difference between those two things. So realize the way I actually do the practical of becoming a mom, what I do as a mother is going to be very individual and dependent upon my family. A matter of fact, I love this quote by Elder Uchtdorf. He says, every family needs saving. As wonderful as it is that this church is known for its strong families, we may often feel this must apply to every Latter-day Saint family except ours. But the reality is that there are no perfect families. Every family has moments of awkwardness. (laughs) And I love that, moments of awkwardness. And some of that awkwardness can be pretty significant sometimes. Have you ever had that in your family as well? Of course there has been awkwardness. And I think we have to be very careful that we do not interpret the struggles and challenges in our families as deviations from this perfect standard, but that we are practicing and living and earning our way into the knowledge that comes when we just try. We try to do the best that we can. In fact, one of my favorite principles of the whole proclamation is the idea of repentance. And that that is going to be one of the best ways to bless our families. Well, and I think along with that, too, we also can't judge other people's families. Just because this is the way I mother my family, somebody else might mother very differently, but that's what that family needs. And so we need to make sure that we do not judge other families for the way they put into practice this family proclamation. The other thing that I wanted to read from the family, a proclamation to the world, is this paragraph. It says, The first commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve 
pertain to their potential for parenthood as husband and wife. And that goes right along with your comment, too. We declare that God's commandment for his children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. We further declare that God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman, lawfully wedded as husband and wife. We declare the means by which mortal life is created to be divinely appointed. We affirm the sanctity of life and of its importance in God's eternal plan. I love these statements, eternal statements, of the foundation of a family, and that is that we have chastity, that we invite children into our homes, even though it's difficult, as we have talked about before. But I also believe very strongly that it is fun. And I think all too often we also don't look at the fun. I love my family, and I love being with my family, and we have a lot of fun together. Yeah. And that's also something that is talked about in the family, the proclamation to the world. There's a wonderful talk given by Elder Robert D. Hales. When he talks about strengthening the family, he gives over 20 suggestions. And I would challenge people to read them because I'm not going to have time to read them all, nor it would be too many slides to put all of these suggestions on slides. But I do think it's wonderful to see how practical these suggestions are. So I'm just going to share just a couple. He says, we can fill our homes with the sound of worthy music as we sing together from the hymn book and children's songbook. And then hold family home evening every week. As parents, we are sometimes intimidated to teach or testify to our children. I have been guilty of that in my own life. Our children need to have a share spiritual feelings with them and to teach and bear testimony to them. So I love these practical experiences that we have. And then here's an apostle also saying that sometimes he doesn't do it completely perfectly either. Right. And for me, that gives me hope because I am not a perfect mom, and yet I believe in these principles as well. Yeah, can I just comment that I think of that course. sometimes those who are preparing or in the stage of their life where they're making decisions about marriage and family, I, I love that you mentioned that it's fun or that it can be fun, oh, right? Definitely. Because I, I feel that many see it as a burden or a chore that would limit them. I remember when Elder L. Tom Perry, um, after the passing of his wife, he gave a conference talk within a year or so after her passing where he reflected upon all the things that he had learned from her. And he said that it had been the least productive year of his life. And I thought that was so fascinating because the world would say that when we shackle ourselves with a wife and a family, that we're not going to be able to achieve everything. But when he said that, it made me realize that when we try to do families in the Lord's way, it empowers us to do more than we could do on our own. And I wish that that's what many people who are fearful of families better understood, that we grow together and experience things together in certain ways that we could not necessarily do on our own, and the Lord helps us to learn and grow in that way. Oh, I have such a strong testimony of that. I think of how my husband supports me and helps me and inspires me to do more, and my children the same way. They are examples to me of living righteously and accomplishing so much in their lives. Now, when we talk about this, I'm going back to also Dallin H. Oaks' talk, which is so powerful when we talk about the proclamation. But he said very much that this is part of the plan, that we also have to understand that these are eternal principles that will enable us to return to our Heavenly Father. And the fact that he is Heavenly Father is also important for us to remember. We are part of his family. We are his sons and daughters. And he said, God created this earth according to his plan, to provide his spirit children a place to experience mortality as a necessary step toward the glories he desires for all his children. While there are various kingdoms and glories, our Heavenly Father's ultimate desire for his children is what President Monson called eternal life in the kingdom of God which is exaltation in families. This is more than salvation. President Russell M. Nelson has reminded us in God's eternal plan, salvation is an individual matter, but exaltation is a family matter. So this is what exaltation is all about. It's about the family.
I was just going to comment that over the last several weeks, we've talked about a welding link in the gospel and about how we can start families now with principles, even if that's not been part of our past or part of our experience. And maybe it's even not now, but we can move forward in that. And then the other thing that we've talked about when we studied Section 138, and we had the vision of the spirit world, that we know that not all of this may happen in this life, but that we have an opportunity to continue to progress as well. And I think both of those principles can kind of be a comfort to us when we recognize gaps and feel the need to fill them in somehow, to know that the Lord has that in place for us. And the plan is that we do it in families, which I think for me brings me great joy. One of my favorite phrases in the proclamation says, successful marriages and families are established and maintained on principles of, and then it lists, faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreational activities. I already mentioned my favorite's repentance, because I think that's the one we need the most. But do you have any thoughts about how we could apply this as an act in doctrine as we consider what we can learn from the proclamation? Well, definitely. I would love for all of us to pick one of those and see if we can institute those in our family. I mean, the wholesome recreational activities, that goes with the fun. And so maybe it is as simple as finding a fun activity to do as a family. And I think we can safely say that by applying any of these things, it will increase the joy and fun we have in our families. Definitely. As we conclude in the Doctrine and Covenants, I did want us to spend a moment reflecting on maybe one thing that we've learned from our wonderful study together Do you have any closing thoughts that you've had from our study this year of the Doctrine and Covenants? Well, I would say that one thing that has really stood out to me in studying the Doctrine and Covenants this year is the reminder that the Lord still speaks, that there have many been wonderful things revealed, many that are revealed, and many that will yet be revealed. And I know that through living prophets that our questions can be answered, and along with that, I think that it's no accident that we've studied that that book of Scripture during this crazy year of our lives because it testifies that God is aware of his children and their struggles and their challenges and that he is with us through all of those things. You know, our thoughts are very similar in that what I have learned is that this is the Church of Jesus Christ. And I think so powerfully I have gained a greater testimony that the Savior is in charge. Back in section 35, you know, many months ago, (laughs) we were studying 35. The Lord very specifically talks about, wherefore I call upon the weak things of the world, those who are unlearned and despised, to thrash the nations by the power of my spirit, and their arm shall be my arm, and I will be their shield and their buckler. As we have talked about the lives of these early saints, I've been so impressed with this verse because they truly were the unlearned. They were despised. And yet the Lord gives this beautiful promise that he would become their arm. But then at the very end, he also gives this wonderful promise, too. He says, lift up your hearts and be glad. Your redemption draweth nigh. Fear not, little flock. The kingdom is yours until I come. So as usual, the Lord wants us to find joy. The Lord wants us to be happy. And it goes back to my statement that I've made many times, woohoo, the gospel's true. (laughs) That's how I feel about the doctrine and covenants in terms of strengthening my testimony that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we would like to thank those at home who have watched and participated with us as we studied the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, Thank you for spending a year with us in the words of Jesus Christ. We have loved learning and studying with you. Thank you.